Hello everyone, welcome to another video. So in today's video, I want to talk about some important uh, questions and answers on AWS. This is a part one. So there will be many more videos like this, which is going to prepare you well for any interview uh, in, in DevOps or uh, for a cloud engineer role or for a Linux system administrator in AWS. So all, all the roles uh, will be covered in these interview questions. All right. So uh, let's start with the very first question. <clears throat> the first question is, I have a single EC2 instance running a production application without any auto scaling group. The application is slow and I need to change its instance type to improve its performance. How to change the instance type? Okay. So if you have watched my video on uh, AWS EC2 instances deep dive, it, it covers the concept of instance type there. Okay. But uh, Anyways, so <clears throat> just remember whenever you have to change the instance type of an EC2 instance, you have to stop the instance. Okay. So the answer to the question is to change the instance type, we must first stop the instance by taking appropriate downtime from the application owner, change the instance type and start the instance again. It usually takes a few minutes to get the instance in running status. So why I have, uh, mentioned here some additional details because when I, since it is it is given in the question that the application is running in production so in production you uh, cannot just I mean, go ahead and stop the instance just like that okay you have to take a proper approval from the application owner you, you also have to raise a change request okay so i mean uh, if you can mention all the details in your interview uh, that will make i mean uh, that will make the uh, interviewer really confident about you and uh, and you will also gain a lot of confidence in the interview okay so uh, you know uh, uh, try to mention all the details that is relevant to the question so since it is given here that the application is running in the production environment so it is really uh, crucial to mention all these things all right so uh, let's see it in action on aws management console how you can how you can uh, change the instance type of an EC2 instance. Okay. So I'm already logged into my EC2 instance here. Okay. And uh, suppose this is the instance. <clears throat> so there's only one instance running right now. Okay. Test hyphen EC2. So if I have to change the instance type of this instance, I have to select it. Then I have to go to actions and then I'm going to uh, 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 go to instance settings. So if I click on instance settings right now, you can say, you can see that change instance type option is not enabled. Okay. And there's a message also, this action is available when the instance is stopped and is not enabled for hibernation, which means I have to stop the instance first, only then this option will be available for me. Okay. So just go to instance state, stop instance, stop. So once the instance is in stop status, it's going to take a moment here. Okay, then you will get the uh, the option to change the instance type. <clears throat> okay, so let it just stop. It usually takes like uh, 30 to 45 seconds. Okay, so, so just remember that, I mean, I just had to concentrate on, on the question itself. Okay, I mean, whatever information is mentioned. So uh, try to answer the question accordingly. Okay. All right, so it's still stopping, stopped. Okay, so the instance is stopped now. Now if I again choose the instance here and then go to actions and instance settings, you will see the option is enabled now. Change instance type, then choose the instance. So here I'm using t2.micro, let's change it to t3.micro maybe. Okay, and then you get the details also. Okay, how much it's going to cost you. So I'm using on-demand Linux instance here. Okay, it is a, uh, it is using Amazon Linux uh, uh, AMI. So in this case, uh, if if I change this t2 dot micro to t3 dot micro, then per hour charges will change from 0 0.01162 to 0 0.0104 USD per hour. Okay. So this is how you just change the instance type and click on apply. Okay, instance type is changed successfully. You get the message. 
okay now i can start the instance again so to to change the instance type you must stop the instance remember this all right <clears throat> then question number two the storage on my ebs volume is filling up fast and i need to extend the volume size without any downtime so can i extend the volume on the fly if yes why if not why okay so the uh, so once again i have already made a video on ebs volumes in my uh, video on uh, aws storage basics for devops engineers you can go and, and watch that video to to have uh, you know the understanding of all the storage basics in aws okay but anyways so <clears throat> the ebs volumes can be extended on the fly which means you don't need any downtime to extend an ebs volume in aws okay so the answer to the question is yes we can extend an ebs volume on the fly without any downtime but there are certain steps to it that you have to follow so just remember whenever you are extending the size of an ebs volume the volume does not become available uh, become usable almost immediately okay you have to perform some steps from inside of the operating system as well because when you are uh, trying to extend the volume okay after the volume you have to see which partition of the volume is to be increased or uh, uh, extended okay so i mean uh, step one is you have to uh, go to your aws management console or you can do it from aws cli also but since i have not covered anything for aws cli i am going to do everything from the management console so i mean once you once you go to the uh, the console you have to modify the volume okay then change the volume uh, size I mean, whatever you want and then you have to log into the instance and then you have to run certain commands to extend the volume and make it usable to your ec2 instance okay so how you can do that after you have extended the volume from the management console you have to check if the the volume modification worked for you or not for that you have to run a command called lsblk lsblk stands for list block devices so it's going to give you the information of the block devices attached to your ec2 instance so here you can check if the the volume uh, I mean size that you changed okay worked or not okay then then uh, i mean after that you have to check which uh, 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 which partition you have to extend because each each volume each um, uh, this block device that you attach to your instance is divided into certain partitions okay so i mean you have to uh, check which uh, partition number you have to extend but i mean i mean if you don't do anything on your own so generally it is a partition number one that you have to extend to extend the volume of your uh, ebs volume okay and then there are two types of instances in ec2 if you are using a Zen instance, you have to use this command. If you are using a Nitro instance, then you have to use this command. Okay, and 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 it is pretty easy to uh, check which, uh, I mean, which of the two insta uh, instances you are using. Okay, so I'm I'm going to show you in a in a demo. Okay, just a bit, but I, I just wanted to make you understand the the meaning of these commands. So first, you have to extend the volume from the from the console. Okay. Then you have to check if that that volume modification worked for you or not. Then you have to extend the partition of the volume of your uh, for the block device. Then you have to extend the file system, okay? Because each partition will have a file system mounted on it, okay? So you have to extend the size of your file system also. So it is like a three-step process, you can say, okay? So so let's see uh, this. Uh, this thing in action on AWS management console. So let me go to my uh, AWS console and uh, here there's one instance which is already running. So I'm going to take the example of that one. Okay, so I'm going to choose the instance here. Then I'm going to go to storage. Then I'm going to scroll to my uh, this volume device, this uh, EBS volume. Then I can open this in, in the new tab. Okay, so step one. 
step one you have to uh, extend the size of the volume from the console okay and, and if you see the instance is a running status so there's no downtime to your application you just have to uh, do it on the fly without stopping the instance without impacting your application at all okay so it can be done live so just uh, choose your volume then go to actions then go to modify volume then you have to change the size so uh, let's increase it from 8 gb to 9 gb because we just want to test uh, this step okay and then click on modify and you will get, you will get this message okay uh, which, is, which is going to show you some details of i mean what's going to happen when you uh, increase the size of the volume okay and uh, and whatever the steps you have to perform after that so all all that information is given in this as well and there are some links also that you can go to and refer to so so this is the great thing about aws it has like uh, i mean uh, almost perfect documentation attached to each and every step that we are trying to perform here okay so i mean you can always refer to it and it is always available on that prompt itself okay i mean where you're trying to perform something and you get the documentation url also all right so let's click on modify and just after that if i click on this volume id again i can see the status will be changed from in use to in use optimizing which means it is trying to optimize your volume to the desired value of the desired value that you've chosen in your volume uh, this modification step okay just after that what you have to do you have to ssh to your instance okay so let me ssh to my instance i click on connect copy the example command go to my mobax term terminal and type the ssh command to ssh to the instance and then i am going to show you how you can extend the volume from inside of the operating system okay let's accept the fingerprint all right so i'm i'm logged into the machine now and as you can see in the command the first command is sudo lsblk so let's run the command i'm using sudo because i'm logged in as a regular user ec2 hyphen user so i'm going to use lsblk to elevate my permissions okay now as you can see <clears throat> as you can see here uh the size of my block device which is this one nvme0 n1 has been extended to 9 gb okay but the size of the the block device has been extended to 9 gb but within this where my data resides okay as you know the data resides under slash which is the root directory okay so this root directory is mounted on this partition okay this is called the partition of your block device and this is a partition number one okay the meaning of this okay p1 means it is the partition one okay nvme0 n1 and then p1 means a partition one so the size of the partition is still 8 gb so this is what we uh, I mean, we have to work on okay so now next command is once again you have to identify if you are using a zen instance then the name of the this this block device will be slash dev slash xvda for the root volume remember this but in in this case i'm using a nitro instance because the name is nvme 0 n1 so in this way you can you can just see i mean if you're using a zen instance or a nitro instance so in this case i'm using a nitro instance because the name is nvme 0 n1 which is for this a nitro instances so now i'm going to copy this command from here exact command and I'm going to control C and paste it here. As you can see, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to grow the the partition, okay, on this block device, and I'm I'm going to uh, I mean grow the partition number one, which is this one, because it is my uh, this main partition which holds all my data in the root directory. Okay, so when I run the command, it's going to give me the message that this partition one has changed okay the size has changed now okay next is now i have to extend the file system okay now i have to extend the file system so so there are two types of I mean, file system that you will have in a uh, i mean uh, uh, on a linux ec2 instance okay by default 
So once again, there are multiple types of file system available in Linux. Okay, here we are talking about either ext4 or xfs. So you have to check first which which file system you are using. Okay, to check that uh, the command is df df space hyphen small h capital T. Okay, I think I ha I have to mention this command also here to check the file system. So let me add this command here. df space hyphen h capital T to check file system type okay so when i run the command i can see as you can see again df hyphen ht is going to show me that on my the main uh, uh, this partition okay which is uh, uh, mounted on on my root directory I'm using XFS type of file system. So for XFS, you have to run this command. Okay. So sudo XFS underscore growfs space hyphen D and then your amount point, which is root in my case. So this may change. Remember this, but here, as you can see, this partition has been mounted on my root file system. So I'm using the root root directory okay so this is going to change the size of my file system and as you as you can see the size is still 8 gb and it's not 9 gb so if uh, so after i run the command it's going to show me the message and if i run the command again you can see the the file system size has also changed to 9 gb from 8 gb okay so this is the process to extend a volume in linux and then make it usable to your ec2 instance i hope the concept is clear even now, if you have any doubts, just please let me know in the comment section. All right, let's move on to the next question. <clears throat> just question number three. So I have an instance in a public subnet that I need to stop and start on a schedule. The problem is its public IP address changes every time I stop and start it. Okay. So is there any way by which I can keep the public IP of the instance static? So this is a very good question and sometimes it is asked in the interviews. Okay. So, <clears throat> so uh, the default behavior of an EC2 instance, which is in a public subnet is when you stop and start your instance, the public IP of the instance changes every time. Okay. Remember this, but if you have a requirement wherein you want to keep this IP static, then there's an option to use something called as elastic IP. So you can attach an elastic IP to an instance, which is going to keep your public IP static. Okay. Even after multiple stop and starts. Okay. So the answer to this question is yes, we can keep the public IP static by associating the instance with an elastic IP. In this way, the public IP given to the instance by the elastic IP will not change on stop and start. Okay. So let's see it in action. So let's use the same instance. So in this, this instance has this public IP. If I stop and start the instance, is, uh, the uh, this public IP is going to change. Okay. But since I, I want this IP to be static, so what I can do is I can go to elastic IP section from here. Okay. Let's open this elastic IPs in another tab. Then click on allocate elastic IP addresses. Uh, allocate elastic IP address. And you can get one IP address from uh, Amazon spool of IP v4 addresses. Okay. And let's not change anything here and just click on allocate. Okay. Then uh, you can uh, 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 associate this uh, elastic IP address to your instance by just, just clicking on here. So just click on this uh, option here, associate this elastic IP address. Then you get the option to choose your instance. So here you can see I am getting the option of test iPhone EC2 also. Just, just choose the instance and then just click on associate. Okay. Don't do anything else. Just click on associate. So elastic IP address associated successfully. Okay. Now if I go to my instance and refresh it, you will see that that same elastic IP attached here. Okay. As you can see, it is 34, 224, 219, 225. And here also you can see it is the same. So now if I stop then start my this instance, the IP address is not going to change that. All right. So this is the way to keep up 
to keep a static public IP for your EC2 instances. All right, next question. Question number four. Can you launch an EC2 instance directly from an EBS volume snapshot? If yes, how? If no, why? So the answer to this question is we cannot launch an EC2 instance directly from an EBS volume. Okay, this is because to launch an instance, we need two more things that are not available with an EBS snapshot. So once again, if you've seen my video on AWS Storage Basics, I've, I've covered this concept in a lot of detail, but let me tell you this anyways. So when you create a volume snapshot, an EBS volume snapshot, so what happens? It, it is a point in time a backup of your EBS volume. That means the time at which you are taking the backup, it's going to keep uh, like a photo of your of your volume, okay? And then just store it as, as the backup, okay? But in case of an AMI, you get one EBS snapshot of your volume, okay? You also get something called as block device mapping, okay? The meaning of this, this uh, block device mapping is this. Let me just log into the instance. Sorry, it's not going to work. Let me choose the IP and, and show it to you what it means. So I'll just copy this uh, command from here. Okay, uh, let's click on this, click on connect, copy this command from here and log in. Going to ask for fingerprint. And now I'm logged into the instance. So the meaning of this, this block device mapping is if I run the command df space hyphen ht, so it's going to show you all the uh, free disk space on your on your instance. Okay, as you can see, this and this. So, uh, or maybe I, uh, the better command to show it is lsblk. Okay, lsblk is going to show you your main uh, block devices. So so this is the the block device mapping okay the the main device or the root device volume holding your operating system will have nvme 0 and 1 which means the name of the device will be slash dev slash nvme 0 and 1 so this is called the block device mapping which is there in your ami okay and this is really uh, I mean, crucial to launch an instance so your EBS snapshot does not have your this block device mapping available. Okay, mm -hmm. it just has the point in time backup of your EBS volume. That's it. Okay, but to, to launch an instance, you need uh, the snapshot plus the uh, this block device mapping, and you also need the launch permissions. So your AMI has three things in it. Okay, it has your block device mapping, the snapshot, and the launch permissions. Okay, so this is the difference between the snapshot and AMI and, and this is the reason you, you cannot launch an uh, instance directly from a snapshot, but you can launch an instance from an AMI. Okay, so the, the answer to this, to this question is this. No, we cannot launch an EC2 instance directly from an EBS volume snapshot. We can create an AMI from a snapshot and then launch the EC2 instances. Okay, now let's see this, action, this in action on AWS. So this is my instance. Okay, uh, let me take an example of snapshot. I already have a snapshot created. So this is the snapshot. Okay, if I choose the snapshot, I'll try to see if I have the option to create an EC2 instance from the snapshot. So I'll, I'll just choose the snapshot here. I'll click on actions and I can see there's no option to launch an instance. Okay, there's no option to launch an instance, but I can create an image, which means AMI, 
the meaning of image here is AMI. So I can create an image from snapshot. If I click on this image option, let's do test AMI. Copy this in a description as well. And uh, let's keep everything default. Okay. And then just click on create image. The image is, is being created after the image is created then you can use this to launch an instance so image is already available okay if i click on the image here i get the option from launch instance from ami i hope the concept is clear okay so you can launch an instance from an ami but not from a snapshot but you can create an ami from a snapshot next question is can you change the primary ip address of an ec2 instance after creation so this is like a theoretical question, but really uh, I mean, crucial to understand that you cannot change the primary IP address of an EC2 instance. Okay, once it is created. Okay, so the answer is no, we cannot. So you get the option to attach an ENI of your choice, elastic network interface holding a particular IP address while you are creating the EC2 instance. But I mean, once the once the uh, the uh, the machine is created so then you cannot change the primary ip address of the ec2 instance and if you want to use that same ip address you have to terminate the instance okay that's the only option to release the ip address attached to the instance you have to terminate the instance all right remember these these concepts for interview all right uh, next question uh, okay, can I preserve a private IP address attached to an AWS EC2 instance after termination so that I can attach it to another EC2 instance? Okay, so I mean we have to preserve the, the, the private IP address which is attached to an EC2 instance after termination so that we can attach it to another EC2 instance. Yes, we can do that. Okay, I mean how we can do that? Yes, uh, by changing the, the the termination behavior of the ENI or elastic network interface, okay, we can set it to not get deleted on instance termination. Alright, so let's see this in action on AWS. So here I'll, I'll, I'll take the same instance that I've been using for all the examples. Okay, this is the instance. And if I just go to the networking section here, I can see one ENI attached to this. Okay, so this is the ENI. So let me click on this ENI. So once again, the question is, uh, I mean, how you can preserve the 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 private IP address attached to the instance. So just remember, each each private IP address is. I mean hold uh, I mean his uh, I mean held by one ENI attached to the instance always okay so you can preserve the ENI that's going to preserve the IP address okay so here in this case what you have to do is you have to just go to this this network interfaces section just choose your ENI of your choice and then just click on actions and then click on change termination behavior if I click on it I get this option so if you see the default behavior of an ENI is to get terminated. Okay, delete on instance termination enabled, which means this ENI will be deleted after instance termination. So this is a default behavior. If you want to just, I mean, preserve it, just uh, uncheck this option and then click on save. So now if I, if I terminate my instance, this ENI will be preserved and I can attach it to another instance on creation. Okay, so this is the, the concept of ENI, okay, how to preserve an ENI or the private IP address. All right, uh, then question number seven, okay, can we change the volume type of our EBS volumes on the fly? If you, if you remember again from my storage uh, storage video, so there are I mean, various uh, I mean, volume types for EBS volumes that we can use, the okay, general purpose, then you have this uh, provisioned IOPS, all right. So yes, you do have the option to change the volume type on the fly, which means you don't have to stop the instance. You don't have to impact the application. You don't need any downtime. You can change the volume type of, our, of your EBS volumes on the fly. Okay. Yes, we can. So let's see this in action on AWS as well. So once again, I'm going to use the same 
same machine. So let's go to uh, let's go back one step. So this is the instance. If I go to my storage section, if I click on storage, I can see one volume attached here. Let me open this in new tab. And, and uh, the, the instance is still in running status. As you can see, it is in running status and I'm trying to change the volume type of an EBS volume. So just choose the instance, uh, just, just choose the volume from here. Go to actions, then click on modify volume once again. This time I want to change the volume type. Okay, so from GP3 to uh, let's try to change it to GP2 and then modify. And you get this message, that's okay. Let's click on modify. All right, since I have, uh, I mean, uh, I just tried to modify the volume, okay, just a few minutes ago. So it, it's giving me a message you have reached the maximum modification rate per volume limit wait at least six hours between modifications per EBS volume okay but anyways since I mean you'll be doing it for the first time I mean you will not see this message so you will be able to modify your volume type okay and you don't need any downtime for your instance okay so just try to do it and let me know if there are any any issues or any any challenges that you face all right so this is about this question let's check the other question the next question is question number eight, which is this one. So recently in an infrastructure security audit, we found that there are some suspicious IP addresses that we need to block to protect our resources in the subnet inside an AWS VPC. So what is the easiest way to achieve this? Now in this example, you have to look at a certain uh, terms that have been used. Okay. They have used IP addresses and they have used block. You want to block the IP addresses. So now if you have watched my uh, this VPC concepts deep dive video, okay, I mean, in that video, uh, when I've covered all the concepts of the VPC in a lot of detail, okay, so I mean, from that video, if you remember, there's one resource that we can use to block IP addresses on a subnet level, okay, which is NACL. So we can use NACL or network access control list to block certain IP addresses inside our AWS VPC. All right. So the uh, answer to this question is we can block all suspicious IP addresses in a in an NACL okay, network access control list as it controls the inbound and outbound traffic inside a subnet. Okay. So uh, let me show this in action in AWS. So let me go to uh, VPC. I apologize. I think there's some problem. There's some slowness in my network today. So it's taking a bit longer than usual. So here you can click on NACLs, Network ACLs. And then you can choose any of any of the NACL. Let's choose this NACL here. And then if you check the uh, this inbound rules you have the option to deny okay so what you can do is you can click on if so for example you want to I mean, block some IP addresses on the inbound interface so just choose your NACL just click on inbound rules and here you can click on add new rule and then you can uh, choose the rule number okay and here you can choose what type of traffic you want to block so for example here I can choose for example, I want to block SSH. Okay, here I just keep the rule number as 99. And uh, here I will choose whether whether I want to allow or deny. Okay, and then here you can choose the, the particular IP address. Okay, so here you can choose deny. And here you can choose the IP address. It can be any IP address, but I'm just taking a random example here just to show you how you can do that. So for 
this one ip address you have to always you have to always use the uh, uh, this uh, slash 32 notation remember this whenever you are specifying one ip address here you have to specify slash 32 uh, this uh, notation here okay which means only one ip address which is this one okay so if i just save changes in this way i can block this particular ip address okay and, and if you remember an nsl's works on rule number so i am using this as the lowest rule number which is 99 which means I want to deny this traffic. So, so this will be denied first and then the other rules will be checked. This is how NACL works. Okay. So in this way you can block any IP address that you want, any number of IP addresses on your NACL. I hope the concept is clear to you. Then question number nine, which is this one. So recently five members have joined the development team and they need same permissions as an IAM user how to achieve this in best way possible. So once again, I've already created one video on uh, AWS IAM Concepts Deep Dive. You can go and check that video on the channel. But anyways, so here, as you can see, uh, the main things are, uh, they've given that you have five members who have recently joined one single team, which is development team, and they all need the same permissions as an IAM user, okay? So if you I mean, go watch my video, I have I've covered one example there which answers this particular question. But anyways, let's answer it here as well. So what you can do is you can create something called as IAM group. Okay, so IAM group means you can add all your different team members to that group. You can attach the permission to the group and then same same group permissions will be uh, given to all the, the team members. Okay, so when I mean, you don't have to create, you know, a separate permission and then attach to each individual user, okay, one by one, you can just create one uh, the single uh, group, okay, and then you can uh, just, I mean, add, add all, all these members to the group and then attach the permission to the group and then uh, that same permission will be given to all the users, okay, by default. So this is a default behavior of an IAM group and this is the main reason we use IAM group, I mean, once we, I mean, I mean, if you have uh, multiple people, okay, which are part of the same team, we don't have to uh, give them, you know, I mean, permissions, I mean, one by one, we can just create one group for them, then just, uh, you know, I try to add all the members to that group and then attach the permission to the group itself. And then all, all the permissions of the group will be given to all the team members, which are part of the group. Okay. So uh, uh, let's see this in action as well. And uh, okay, first, uh, let's see the answer. So the best way is to create an IAM group and then attach the IAM policies to the group, then create the IAM users and associate them with the IAM group. In this way, all members will inherit the same permissions from the same IAM group, okay? So this is the way to, to give permissions to multiple team members of a same team, all right? So if I go to my AWS management console, I can go to IAM section here. So all these are scenario based questions and some of the questions I have also faced in my interviews whenever I have, uh, you know, uh, appeared for the interviews. So some of the questions are from there, but some of the questions are, are from my research that I did on, when, uh, on the most asked questions on uh, uh, EC2 service, EBS service, IAM service and VPC service, okay? so. These questions are from these four services because I mean, I've just covered these four services as of now. So I just wanted to, I mean, uh, just come up with the, the questions that you could be asked on these four services. All right. So I am on my IAM dashboard. Now I can create one group. So I'll just click on groups, this user groups here. I'll click on create group. I can use the name as a dev group. Okay. So just just create the group and then you can attach any permission for example these are developer for example this is the role uh, that i want to give to all the team members so i can just choose this permission and i can click on create user group so now if i click on this 
dev group i can see it has one a permission policy attached to it okay and now what i have to do is i just have to add the users so uh, uh, let's create two users here okay the the example says uh, five users but i'll i'll just create two users and uh, and it is going to be the same for all the users so i am going to create two users now so let's click on users click on create user click on dev user 1 okay then next and this and then just add this user to the group which is dev group and click on next create user okay now let's get another user create user dev user 2 click on next attach the user to the group dev group and click on next create user okay and now if i check the two users dev user 1 it is part of the group here and it has the uh, the same permissions as the group itself okay so this is the way to to uh, assign permissions to a multiple team members of the same group okay and similarly you can check for dev user 2 also it's part of the same group and it has the same permissions all right now let's move on to the last question question number 10 which is this one so i have an ec2 instance which i want to use to upload files to an s3 bucket one of the devops engineers has suggested to use iam user access keys with s3 permissions to achieve this so should i go with this suggestion or is there a better way to achieve this if yes how if no how so once again i have covered this in my aws iam video okay where i where i have i mean covered the uh, the concept of iam roles so here in this example as you can see we i mean we are uh, talking about two different services within aws ec2 and s3 so when you want to uh you know uh, talk to one service from uh another service in that case the best option is to use iam role which means if i want my ec2 a service to talk to s3 in that case i can assign a role to my ec2 instance okay which is going to enable it to upload files to s3 bucket okay but we do have the option to use an iam user access keys as well but it, it is not a safest option and it is not or it is not as the uh, the most secure option okay so if if i check the answer here the best way to achieve this is why an iam role attached to the ec2 instance with s3 permissions attached this is because iam user access keys are long term credentials that do not expire by default and while configuring these are stored in plain text format that can be copied by anyone who has access to the instance and can be used with other ec2 instances as well okay so 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 this is the risk with iam user access keys on the other hand iam roles have a temporary credentials that expire by default okay so let's see this in action on aws so let me go to my console and i can use any user so let's use this particular user so i mean i'm going to show you on both ways how you can use ec2 service okay to talk to s3 service okay and you can use ec2 to upload files to s3 okay so what i can do is first i'm going to show you how you can use it with iam user access keys and what is the risk with it so here i have uh, this iam user here i just have to go to security credentials and i have to create its access keys so just click on create access key click on cli command line interface and just accept this and click on next create access key okay now i'll go to my aws management console okay since i'm using aws linux ami it already has uh, aws cli installed to use i am user access keys you need aws cli already installed on your ec2 instance okay so since i'm using uh, this this uh, this particular operating system it already has aws cli okay to confirm that i can use aws hyphen hyphen sorry space hyphen hyphen version and as you can see i already have aws cli installed all right now what i'll do is 
to configure this this uh, i mean access key and secret access key that is attached to an user okay what i can do is i have to run a command on the uh, this uh, uh, on the terminal which is aws configure so i'll have to run aws space configure and enter now it's going to ask me aws access key id which is this one access key id is this one so i'll just copy this paste it enter now it's going to ask for aws secret access key which is this one copy and paste and then it's going to ask me for the default region name so since i'm using us east one for I mean, most of my work as you can see i'm using this northern virginia the region code for northern virginia is us hyphen east hyphen one so i can go for us east one region here I just want to show you the region code as well as you can see us east us east one so here i have to type us east hyphen one and then i can just leave this as default and enter okay now the next thing i have to do is do is i have to attach the s3 permissions to this user which i have created okay so if i if you remember i i don't have s3 permissions attached to this user which i have uh, you know which i'm using here so what i'll do is i'll click on done here continue and then i'll i'll click on the group section because the permissions are attached to the group i mean the permissions are coming from the group so i'll just attach the same permission i'll attach the s3 permission to the group so i'll click on the group name i'll click on permissions i'll click on add permissions and then i'll click on attach policies then i'm going to search for s3 here and uh, since this is only for demo reasons, I can go for Amazon S3 full access. Okay, then click on attach policies. So the policies are attached. Now, if I check if I'm able to access the S3s, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, if I'm uh, 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 able to run the the uh, I mean commands to check certain things on S3 service or not. So what I can do is the simplest command to check if you're able to connect to S3 is AWS space s3 space ls okay so you see I, I got one result which means i have access to s3 now since this is the only bucket that is there in my account right now so i'm able to see this uh, from the cli as well now the risk that we were talking about with im user access keys i just configured the the access keys so i mean when you do that what happens the access keys are stored in a folder called dot aws in the user's home directory okay so I'm in the user's home directory and if I do ls space hyphen la I can see there's one directory called dot aws if I go to this directory if I do ls again I can see this credential section if I just try to cat the contents of this I can see access key id and secret access key is available in a plain text format which means if someone copies it from here and attaches to another instance that instance will get the same level of access as this im user so this is the risk with uh, I mean using the access keys. Okay, so this is not recommended. Okay, the best way to do it is you have to uh, I mean you have to use an IAM role that you can associate with your EC2 instance and then you can use it with S3 service. Okay, so what I'll do is first I'll just just come out of it and I'm going to delete this folder itself. Dot AWS it's gone now if i try to run the command again s3ls i will see unable to look at credentials you can configure credentials by running aws configure since i deleted the credentials so now i, I cannot use i mean uh, uh, i cannot do anything on the s3 service right now from this ec2 instance so now i'm going to work with the with the im role so what i'll do is i'll go to my im console i'll click on roles I'll click on create role and here I have to use the trusted entity type it will be AWS service use cases I want to use it with EC2 service okay then just click on next then uh, just choose the permission that you want to use with this role which is Amazon S3 full access here click on next role name you can type EC2 S3 demo role 
okay just click on uh, next just click on create role now the role is created now I will attach this role to my EC2 instance. So what I'll do is I'll go to my EC2 instance dashboard here. I'll click on uh, actions. I'll click on security and I'll click on modify IAM role. And here I can choose the role that I just created, which is EC2 S3 demo role, update IAM role. It's going to take like two, three seconds only and the changes are applied immediately you can test it okay so the role is at attached now if i run the command again you can see i am able to use the uh, i mean i am able to uh, search for the s3 buckets the, the, the meaning of uh, this particular uh, command is aws s3 ls means i want to list out all the s3 buckets in this account from my ec2 instance okay so since i already have i mean i just have uh, one S3 bucket here, I'm able to list out that bucket here, okay? Now, if I want to upload objects to this uh, this bucket, I, uh, then I have to use this AWS S3 CP command here, okay? So, I mean, uh, you can test it on your own, but I just wanted to show you how you can associate an IAM role or you can use IAM access keys as well. I mean, uh, IAM user access keys as well, but uh, what is the risk with using the access keys as compared to IAM role, which is the most secure option? okay so i hope the concept was clear to you that in this case in this case when we have this one service which wants to talk to other service we have to prefer iam roles over iam user access keys at all times all right so that's all i wanted to cover in this video i hope the video was beneficial to you if it was please uh, hit the like button and you can share this video with anyone uh, I mean, who wants to prepare uh, for any any role in cloud or devops all linux all right and uh, and please subscribe to my channel as well all right guys that's all i wanted to cover in this video and i'm going to see you in the next one bye